Hey, what's up, universe? It is 4.58 p.m. on Sunday, August 6th, 6th, 2023. There's a lot that's been going on uh, in my brain. I've taken a lot of notes on various things, and I thought about, and I still may do, I haven't quite decided, like a number of different videos, because there's like sections of things that kind of I could talk for probably an hour to an hour and a half, or I could break everything up into its own video. Um, and I haven't decided kind of what I would like to do, because in a way, it all kind of blends together. Uh, but each section would be relevant to have its own piece, or its own section, or its own video. Um, so I'll just kind of start with, from the beginning, I suppose, um, kind of what spurred all of this to, to kind of ins the inspiration. So the inspiration's about 12 hours old. Um, I went to bed around 4.30 in the morning or so, um, just because I, I stayed up, some things caught my attention. So I was, I don't remember what I was doing before, before this, but I, I ran into like a Tesla's Dojo supercomputer. And I hadn't heard of this before. Um, uh, again, I don't remember kind of what led me to that. And so I watched a video or two, um, on that. And if you guys aren't familiar, uh, this is something that Tesla has been working on, uh, for a while. I think they publicly announced it in 2021, uh, if I recall correctly. And, uh, true to, uh, Elon uh, Musk's, uh, I don't want to say character, you know, he's attracting the brightest talent from... Uh, all over the world. And so that supercomputer, um, by 2024, October 2024, they estimate will be the fifth most powerful supercomputer um, in the world. And there's reasons why, you know, people are like, why does an automotive company need to have such a powerful supercomputer? And it's around training um, its self driving cars uh, and I'll just let you research that on your own. And the idea that people are speculating that Tesla is going to do with this because once they're going to keep growing the supercomputer, right? It's not just going to stop. It's not going to plateau. What, they're, what people are speculating that Tesla will do is do a, much what Amazon did with AWS where, you know, it, Amazon created these giant server farms so that way... Amazon, the site itself could handle huge spikes in traffic, save like Black Friday. Um, but for the rest of the year, these giant server farms were basically, you know, not being fully utilized. And so they came up with the idea to rent the, the hardware, to rent the space. And so they turned this into a giant service, which we all know now as AWS, and it's extremely profitable uh, for Amazon. So people are speculating that Tesla is going to be basically doing the same thing, except for instead of an AWS type of style, it's going to be specifically targeted towards training artificial intelligence. And um, the whole design of this supercomputer is radically different than anything that is currently produced or being used by the vast majority of people training AI. It's a it's a whole different architecture as far as um, the chips that are being made, the architecture of the of the design. Um, the closest thing in comparison as far as the idea of how these chips are made and integrated and communicate with each other is Apple's M1 and M2 chips. Uh, aside from that, there's really not anyone else that's done something similar. So this is an interesting that's an interesting development uh, in and of itself, and I have some things that I'll say to that uh, a little bit later. So then, as I'm researching that or kind of becoming aware of this Dojo supercomputer, um, on you know my right hand side of YouTube is for recommended videos is about this. Uh, uh, how do I want to say a new material? Okay. Uh, called LK99. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of that. It's relatively new. Um, a group of researchers in South Korea released a research paper, I believe it was on July 22nd of 2023, um, stating that they have developed or 
uh, created a material that is a superconductor that works at ambient um, pressure, which means uh, that it can be and and within I forget like the I forget like the temperature range, but basically room temperature, room pressure, no special like cooling, no special. Um, environment really uh, for this material to behave as a superconductive material. Now I'm not going to get into the specifics of that because I'm just not that, you know, I'm not, like you can research that yourself as well. There's videos out there, there's people talking about it. I believe I just saw the New York Times talking about it um, within the last day or two, so it's definitely starting to filter out into the uh, public awareness. Uh, it was interesting because some of the uh, first people talking about it were investment firms. Like, of course, people that are managing wealth and things like that are always keeping an eye on cutting edge stuff. And this would be a massive, like, this would change everything. Think of, like, quantum computing is, we've got, we've got asymmetrical technologies happening and being developed right now in, in our life. And it's, it's pretty nuts. So we've got AI and where that's going and then quantum computing is a whole nother thing. And these two things mixed together would be like, obviously next level. So with the, with LK99, if this actually pans out and having a super conductive material that can operate within these types of conditions, and it's actually not that hard to manufacture, it's not that expensive. This is something that could be developed in relatively short order if it pans out. If it proves to be correct, um, it would bring quantum computing into basically the hands of like everyday life and individuals. Like we could have this in our cell phones within like the next decade easily, right? Um, so you can go ahead and research quantum computing and things like that. But the traditional, we'll put it this way: I believe Google's latest quantum computing, which I think is 76 qubits, and I may have the measurements wrong. I think I have the time right, though. I think they said that it can compute and solve problems that in like six and a half or 6.7 seconds, that would take traditional supercomputers roughly 47 years to solve. I believe I saw that. I think I saw that correctly. So we're talking like asymmetrical doesn't even like, to me, doesn't even begin to define this type of technology because it's just radically different. It's just radically different. So LK99, obviously it has implications, not just for quantum computing, uh, but like medical, um, both like MRI type of, you know, devices, uh, maglev trains. There's just an infinite number of applications for this type of material. So, um, I find that to be an interesting thing. So this just led me to um, just go down this down this rabbit hole of just various different things that primarily come back to artificial intelligence in all honesty. And the reason I focus on AI is because as I've gone through my experience with AI as I've researched it, as I've watched the experts talk about it. Um, you know, there's definitely some out there that are like, hey, this is gonna, this could potentially be an extinction level event. Um, and there's others that are like, that's not gonna happen for a long time or even be a potential risk uh, for a long time. And we can, you know, we can build systems that will keep that from happening. Um, now, I'm probably more on the side of the cynicism, like the cynics, where I'm like, I don't know if I really trust humans to be able to build things that won't destroy us because it's just kind of, I don't know, like we still we still have war, right? We still have nuclear weapons on the planet. I don't know, we still have technology that is used to exert power over each other. Um, I don't necessarily trust that we're gonna <laughs> develop things uh, that'll keep us safe, um, at least not before we experience some type of crisis, you know? Um, so that's perhaps my cynicism coming through. And it just, this whole thing led me, and the thing I've been thinking about um, as I've had these conversations with people on, online and LinkedIn um, is that 
this technology is being developed by humans, right? Especially with the, in the context of artificial intelligence. And one of the main goals of artificial intelligence is to create something in our image. Basically, we, like, there's a real desire to be God here. Um, and it makes sense in a way, like I get it, you know? And I also just wanna say I'm not here to spread like fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I'm just, I'm just uh, putting out my thoughts as they've been coming to me. And so with this idea that AI is mimicking our consciousness as best we can, uh, I've always been the voice of like, well, if it is, if it's, if it has some form of consciousness or if it's mimicking some form of consciousness, then there's going to be its binary representation. There's going to be a form of its unconsciousness as well. There's going to be things that it doesn't know. It's going to have the same type of byproducts that we have. You know, if it's in an image of us, and honestly, since humans are creating it, there's always going to be this duality part. There's going to be, yes, it can do these things. Yes, it can solve these problems. Yes, it can be aware of certain things. And then on the flip side, there's going to be things that it is completely unaware of that it still might do, you know, like there's going to be things that it just isn't, there's going to be the, there's going to be the flip side of it, you know what I mean? Uh, and so I've always been like, my thing has always been, I think AI is a beautiful tapestry or canvas to reflect the state of the human condition back to us, to reflect the state of our collective subconscious back to us. Uh, just recently, there were researchers like um, showing uh, how to inject, it's called prompt in, like prompt injection, right? So you can inject, you can send a certain, you can send a prompt to a large language model, something like chat GPT, Llama, Llama 2, uh, and have it start to operate outside of its kind of programmed safeguards and generate you know, text or um, outcomes that there were safe, there were guardrails put in place for. Uh, and it's always this way in any type of human phenomenon, right? Any type of development, there's the constant game of cat and mouse. There's always the light and the dark, the good and the bad, you know, these kind of things, right? The ebb and the flow. And so that's part of what I mean by like, these systems are always going to inherently have some type of underbelly to them, right? And so it's not to detract from the benefits, it's also just to be aware that at the same time, like it's as good as it is bad, or it's as bad as it is good, however you wanna look at it. There's, there's two sides to every coin, right? It's the same thing, this, this is like a wedge topic, you know, this is like any other wedge topic, you know, take guns, like this kind of a thing, right? Yeah, so AI kind of fits the same thing. And so it just makes me really, I just get engaged with this and I get curious about it because it really starts to bring in, in my mind, like a lot of history and a lot of things that we have experienced as a species over centuries and millennia when it comes down to consolidation of power, who's controlling what, what is democracy, you know, like governance, you know, like these types of things, things that we've established as a species and have attempted to put in place so that quote unquote bad things don't happen. Yet, I don't know about you, but there's, I have a healthy dose of skepticism around, uh, you know, those in, in power and those that uh, our, our leaders and things like that, because there hasn't been a system of governance in, uh, that I've ever experienced or witnessed in my research that is completely devoid of corruption because we're human. There's humans involved, right? And so even if we were to build AI and be like, well, we, we're going to take the humans out of it, right? Say something like that. Well, the humans, the, the AI was created by humans. So like as a byproduct, like, I believe that there's going to be this, <laughs> there's still going to be that part embedded into the system, right? Is there really a way to escape 
what we have created. Can an artist truly separate themselves from their art? I don't, I personally am having a difficult time with that. I, I personally don't, don't see that, that being the case. And then, you know, of course, this leads down the, um, the path of, uh, uh, there was a monk debate uh, a couple of months ago, maybe three months ago now, um, with uh, four different panelists. Uh, I can't remember all of their names. There's um, Jan LeCun, um, Yashua Bingio, Max something rather, and Melanie something rather. And I can't remember where they work and how they're contributing, but these are experts within the field of AI. The debate was around, is AI an existential threat to the human species? Could this be an extinction level event? Now, that's a very bold statement. It's a, it's, it's a very big claim, and I get that. And at the same time, I lean more towards like, Max and Yashua were like, this could definitely be an existential threat to the human species. And uh, Jan and uh, Melanie are like, it's like, no, like we don't have to worry about that. Um, <laughs> again, I just, from what I have been, through all the different research I've done on a wide variety of topics, I just don't necessarily trust the species to safeguard itself before a crisis. Now, especially in the context of what we are talking about with AI and with the idea of consciousness and kind of one of the major drives or goals of AI is to create a basically autonomous, more or less self-aware, or at least a very aware um, entity that is able to perform actions, right? You can take a look at any of the sci-fi films, any of the sci-fi, you know, shows, things like this. You got androids that are helping humans, especially in like deep space travel. Like there are uses that we would need to have something like that to kind of move us beyond earth or to do some of these things that we couldn't do before then, before these types of entities existed. Uh, so it's not really outside of the realm that we would continue to push towards that. Science fiction usually turns into science truth. You know, you could take a look at uh, Star Trek and transparent aluminum. That was sci-fi for a while, but that's now been a science fact for, for, for a little bit. Like transparent aluminum is a thing. Uh, so the idea that we would create these entities that are very much human-like, both in perhaps appearance and ability and reasoning and function, um, really in my mind is no different than creating another species. And Yashua talks about this and he defines it that way too. And so, which makes me, you know, which perpetuates me down another, further down the hole, where it's like, okay, well, if we as a species, if we as a human species develop a whole nother species, and one that can compete with us in the sense of like resources, um, you know, the desire to control its environment, and now we are part of that species environment. So there's gonna be things about us that that species may want to control. Um, it brings up a lot, you know, a lot of questions around um, just a, a potentially our survival. And then uh, if we go back, we look at the history of earth itself, you know, um, I ran into another, this wasn't, Oh, I'm trying to remember if this talk, it's a couple of years old now. I'm trying to remember if it was related to, I think it was related to artificial intelligence. Um, but one of the things I remember from the, uh, from the talk was one of the guys was like, 99% um, of all previous species on the planet have, are no longer in existence. Um, and so uh, I went ahead and did some research on that. And that's, that seems to be a truth that um, that 99% of 
previous species are no longer in existence on the planet. And so this just reminded me of um, like the X-Files. There's an episode, I believe it's season four, episode 12 or episode 14. And it has to do with uh, Leonard Betts, I believe is the name of the episode. And um, Mulder, there's this line that always stuck with me and I have it pulled up uh, here. And he says, I'll just kind of quote it. Uh, he says, recent evolutionary theory would disagree. What scientists called punctualism or punctual equilibrium, it theorizes that evolutionary advances are cataclysmic, not gradual. That evolution occurs not along a straight line, graph, not along a straight graphable line, but in huge fits and starts, and that the unimaginable happens in the gaps. The gap between what we are and what Leonard Betts has become. Now, that's a whole different episode, like that's a whole different type of uh, uh, experience or evolution in that episode, but it gives the idea, um, and, there, and I did look that up as well, that this is a thing, this punctual equilibrium and is a theory of evolution where there are these periods of stability where a species is all good, and then there's these, um, let's see, how did they, how did they put it? Um, sorry, I'm taking a look here. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, so I was doing work with uh, ChatGPT to like help me articulate some of this stuff. It says, in this view, species tend to remain relatively unchanged for extended periods when environmental conditions are stable and suitable for their survival. However, when significant environmental changes or other factors create new opportunities or challenges, certain populations may undergo rapid evolutionary changes leading to the emergence of new species. Um, yeah, and so it's, uh, so punctuated equilibrium proposed by paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge in the early 1970s um, suggest that the pattern of evolution is characterized by long periods um, let's see, there was something, oh, here we go. This is what I was uh, asking. I was like, I said, is it true that 99% of all species that have ever lived on the earth before now are extinct? And it says, yes, it's true that the vast majority that has ever lived on earth are now extinct. Estimates, estimates suggest that around 99% of all species that have ever existed are no longer present on the planet. Earth, Earth's history has been seen numerous extinctions due to various factors, such as natural events, changes in the environments, and interactions between species. But there was something around, like, um, uh, how do I want to say this? Um, here we go. This is what it is. Punctuated equilibrium stands in contrast to the traditional view of gradual and continuous evolution proposed by Charles Darwin. According to punctuated equilibrium, evolutionary change occurs in bursts due to various factors like environmental disruptions, genetic drift, or key innovations, rather than a slow, steady progression. In these key innovations where we've got AI, quantum computing, things like LK99 that could potentially like revolutionize uh, quantum computing, like these would be key innovations. And it <laughs> it's just interesting to me, um, the, uh, the times that we're in, I guess is what I'm kind of getting down to. And it just really brings up for me the deeper questions of around like, as we have governed ourselves, as we have created systems to create stability for ourselves, and yet as a species, we remain hugely divided. Um, it always just brings back the question of like, will we ever come to a point where we will be unified as a species and I've just entertained the thought that AI would be that existential threat where it's kind of like, okay, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? This unifying thing. And, you know, there's movies out there about that around like um, Pacific Rim is one of them where like, obviously there's 
monsters coming out of the ocean, but like that are destroying humanity. But like the idea is the same, right? There's this, there's this thing outside of our species that is threatening our species. And so as a species, we come together. Now, I would like to think, like I just haven't seen examples of where that mentality of the enemy of my enemy is my friend creates an enduring lasting pact or peace or unity, right? Because I think it's still fundamentally flawed based on where it comes from because it's embedded in the language. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, it's like we're all the same species. Like there are no enemies. There's just human beings. You know what I mean? Like, so will we move beyond that type of concept? And then of course it comes back, like what I was gonna say about the, you know, Elon Musk and the Dojo supercomputer is that, you know, and this comes up with AI too, the consolidation of power. Um, in, there's Meta is releasing, you know, like Llama 2 and Audiogen and like these AI models that are publicly available so people can download them, anybody could download them, I've downloaded them, and they could start to build upon these models and for whatever purpose, for whatever purpose. And so that's the open source version of these technologies, right? And so there's the question of whether or not that is quote unquote a good thing because people could then take these models and these weights and then do whatever they want to with them. And maybe that's not the best thing because there might be bad actors out there that could potentially do harm, you know? And if one were to read the book, um, what is it? The Sovereign Individual by uh, uh, Alfred Tennyson Moss, I believe. That could be the completely wrong name. Um, it's by two economists, and I think it was published in the 1990s, and it has to do about the economies of scale of violence and how small groups, single individuals will be able to, in the future, be able to extract huge amounts of violence upon a population. And this, that book was, uh, was pretty mind blowing for me when I was reading it uh, in college. So it came out in like maybe the nineties or early two thousands. Um, definitely a good read, but it just goes into that kind of thought, right? Where it's like, you start to have these technologies that are available where people, you know, it's, some would argue that it's not easy, quote unquote, to build these things. And at the same time, it's becoming easier. I would say that if I am able to build a chat bot, then there's brighter minds than me out there that can take this stuff and do other things with it, right? And so then it's like, okay, well, do we leave it to open source and, um, and democratize it and allow everyone to have access to it? And there's a big push for that. And I can understand that. Or do we create these bodies of governance where, you know, we have these multinational institutions where, you know, there's a, where there's a consolidation of power and only, you know, only select people have access to this. Um, a lot like how supercomputers and quantum computers are and the access to like nuclear material and things like that. There's, it's heavily regulated, it's heavily monitored, it's, it's tracked, it's very much, you know, in a controlled state. Now, that being said, even nuclear material, like we have examples of that stuff, even though it's insanely regulated and, and tracked, there's a vast majority, like a pretty sizable amount, more than it's concerning, that's just kind of disappeared. You know, like this stuff could do harm. Um, so even if, I'm just saying that even if we create these systems of governance, like it just goes back to that binary state of the human condition, right? Where it's kind of like we create these systems as best we can. And, you know, are we ever going to create something that we're just not going to be able to pull back from, you know, and try as we may. And so it just, to me, it just brings up all of these things. There's a lot of questions. I find it to be an interesting time to live in. And there's a lot going on. There's a lot, there's a lot. And um, anyway, I had, that's not all of my notes. There's other things that I was gonna talk about, uh, but I think that'll probably, that'll probably do it for right now because I've been talking for almost 30 minutes. So I would love to, you know, if you guys have any comments or anything like that, uh, certainly put them down below or at least, um, you know, feel free to research this stuff yourself. There's a lot of 
a lot of chatter going on around all of it and uh <laughs> just reminded of the of the line from mr robot exciting times in the world right now exciting times <laughs> uh all right i'm gonna wrap it up and um yeah there's other things that i have listed here and i'll just i'll just come back to it another time all right i love you guys i'll talk to you later <laughs> bye